We know how to change the weight of our mountain bikes, how to add a burlier setup or indeed lighten it up. We know we can change pretty much any single piece of componentry for a different purpose. But how do we change the geometry of our mountain bikes? Well, today, with some slightly left of field thinking, I'm gonna take my nukeproof reactor into three distinct different geometry setups. So what is my goal? My goal, like I said, is to take this bike into three very different setups. The first is an XC inspired bike, not totally dissimilar from the Reactor ST. The second is the bike as you see it before you, my middle ground, which is my go-to normal riding setup. And the third is a bike where, well, I'm gonna try and increase the rear travel, but I also want to give it the same head angle as the Reactor RS. Now the RS is the most aggressive bike in the Reactor lineup and comes with a 10 mil longer fork as stock. So what tools do I have available to me to change the geometry? Well, the first and most obvious is the flip chip on the seat stay. Now this means I can alter the geometry between two settings. There's trail and rail. Trail is half a degree steeper, so it takes the seat tube and head tube to 75.5 degrees and 66 degrees respectively. And it's not just the geometry that changes, but also the kinematics of the suspension itself. Now, having it in trail mode basically increases the value of anti-squat. This essentially means that it will be more efficient under pedaling. But like everything with mountain bikes, it's a trade-off. A higher value of anti-squat tends to impede suspension performance when descending. But that's why Nukeproof give you the flip chip so you can decide for yourself. So that's my first means of adjustment. What's my second? Well, my second is I'll be adjusting the stroke length of the shock. So what is stroke length? Stroke length is the length of suspension that compresses. So for instance, on a 140 mil travel fork, the stroke length is 140 millimeters, but our shocks have a lot less length. So how does that work? Well, on a linkage system, there will be a ratio, say three to one. That means for every centimeter that the shock compresses, the rear axle will move three centimeters. This particular shock on this particular bike has a standard stroke length of 50 millimeters, giving 130 millimeter travel. But I can decrease it to 47.5 millimeters and increase it to 55 millimeters. That means I can take it down to 125 mil travel whippet, or indeed increase it to a burly 140 mil travel bike. And that's not all. To accompany the different travels out back, I'll also be changing some of the fork internals and things at the front of the bike to boot. Now, when I thought about this video, I wanted to keep it relatively cheap as I wanted it to be something that you could potentially think about doing yourselves. It's for that reason I imposed a strict 100 pound budget cap upon this challenge. So needless to say, I had to get a little bit inventive later on. So this is my first setup and it will count as my midway point. It is a 140 mil travel fork paired to a 50 mil stroke length, which gives 130 mil of rear wheel travel. I run it in the rail mode. So that gives a seat tube angle of 75 degrees and a head tube angle of 65.5. Now a modern trail bike like this can do pretty much anything. And it covers me for all the eventualities I find out on my riding. Now a huge factor in this and something that's very important when fettling with our suspension is sag because sag is kind of king when we're setting up our shocks. For that reason, I'm gonna keep it very consistent. Always 30% on the rear and 20% on the fork, irrespective of stroke length. The importance of sag cannot be overstated and that's for a couple of reasons. The chief of which is that it is relative. That means that 30% of a 50 millimeter stroke is obviously longer or more than 30% of a 47.5 millimeter stroke. This therefore then consequently changes how the bike rides dynamically. If you'll bear with me and take on a couple of assumptions regarding you know, spring rate and progressivity. If you have two of the same bike, 
both running 30% sag, but with different stroke lengths, and they hit the same bump, and we know that the speed and velocity, etc., is all the same, they will use a different amount of the rear wheel's travel. That's because there is something that we can adjust, and that's spring rate via air pressure. In that scenario, because I'm always going to set my bike at 30% sag, it means a shorter stroke length when hitting the same bumps will use less of the bike's travel. That means it sits higher in the travel and consequently keeps the geometry steeper. This is really good if we want a bike that's gonna spend more time going uphill. Conversely, when you have the sag point deeper into the rear shock stroke, that means it will slacken out the angles more. That's because the more rear travel you use, the slacker the angles become. Keep an eye on this inclinometer, which I'm going to attach to the fork, okay? I'm going to cycle it through the rear wheel travel, and you're going to see how much that can change. With a shorter length stroke, even at bottom out, the bike won't be going to such an extreme place. Now that's going to affect everything. Head angle, trail, bottom bracket height, you name it, it's in there. And that is why it is so vitally important that you set up sag correctly in the first place. It's worth noting here that as the fork compresses, it steepens up the angles, so they can largely cancel one another out. It's also worth thinking about pedal efficiency here because it is relative to both sag and stroke length, and that's one of the things that makes it such an interesting thing to explore. A shorter travel bike, anti-squat notwithstanding, will pedal more efficiently than a longer travel bike, and that's because it's relative to sag. Changing stroke length and changing the flip chip do quite different things. That's because one changes where the bike pivots around and the other changes the amount of rear wheel travel. Now, most people tend to run their bikes in the low settings with their flip chips, but funnily enough, in a weird twist of fate, this is the only setting today that I'll be having with the rail mode. So now it is time for the first change. I want to change it into XC mode. That means I want to change the stroke length front and back. I want to steepen up the angles and increase the level of anti-squat. So let's get into it. So the first thing I've done is reduce the travel of the fork by fitting a new air spring. I've taken it down from 140 millimeters to 130 millimeters. Now this steepens up the head tube and the seat tube angle by around half a degree. So the head tube is now 66.5 and the seat tube angle is 76 degrees. This was the first thing that ate in to my budget. The air spring cost me around 35 pounds. And speaking of steepness, not only did I reduce the travel in the fork, but I've switched it into trail mode. This means my riding position in terms of head tube and seat tube angle is a whole degree steeper than normal. And not only that, having it in trail increases the value of anti-squat so it will be more efficient on the pedals. Now people often ask us, is it easy to detect half a degree change here or a small incremental change there? Well. It depends on rider to rider. I don't believe it's necessarily anything to do with rider skill, but more consistency. If you're very consistent in your inputs when you're riding, then when the output is different, you can kind of you know, get an idea of what's change and what's you. Like I said, I don't think it's got anything necessarily to do with skill or speed. It's just about you know, being consistent and quite methodical in your riding. I also took out that five millimeter spacer from the shock and replaced it with a 7.5 millimeter spacer. This reduces the travel to 125 millimeters at the rear axle. Now, 2.5 millimeters, it doesn't sound like very much, but you've got to remember that it's relative to sag. We're going to be running the same 30% sag, which means it's gonna be running higher in its travel, which means the angles will be steeper as we ride it, which really lends itself towards climbing. Now, could we have just pumped up the shock a bit harder? Potentially, but where's the fun in that? 
Now I think the bike rides very differently in this setup. It's like a bit of a rocket ship, especially on the descents. That's because, well, around here in Bath, a lot of our descents aren't that technical, they're not that rough. And so, you know, as you're pumping the bike, it's that bit sharper, that bit more responsive, and that's because the travel is reduced. You know, pedal efficiency is one way that, you know, the rider's weight and mass affects the suspension, but also when we maneuver in turns and pump lumps and bumps on the trail. So it does ride very differently, and it turns this trail hooligan into something of a rocket ship. As I mentioned earlier, I'm trying to do all these changes for 100 pounds, but you could put on some lighter tires, and I think, you know, this isn't something I would do week in, week out, this sort of change. But if I had one bike such as this, and I wanted to go for a 100 kilometer cross country epic, would I do this change? Absolutely, especially in the fork. That's a really, really big one. Like I said, you could just pump up the shock a little bit harder, but the fork, there's no substitute for that. So now it is time for the main event. How to make a versatile trail bike versatilier. Well, what do I want? I want to give it the same head angle as the Reactor RS and increase the travel to 140 mil at the back. So you might recall the earlier one we mentioned the travel spaces. So this is the stock five millimeter one. This is the 7.5 millimeter one I put in to limit the travel in XC mode. And now they are both out the bike to give it 140 mil travel at the back. So are there any associated problems with increasing the rear travel? Well, absolutely. Clearance is the main one. As the wheel comes up, it might even be touching that seat tube. So I'm gonna be running it in the bike's trail mode to give it a bit more clearance. Now, this is one of the reasons I stayed away from offset bushes. It's because that would actually essentially decrease the eye to eye of the shock, bringing that rear wheel ever closer. Now, another thing that is worth bearing in mind here is, well, I wanted to make the bike more aggressive. So counterintuitively, I'm having to run it in the trail mode, which steepens the angles. So by putting it in trail mode, I am a whole degree off my target of 65 degrees. So what can be done? Well, let's go back to my 100 pounds budget cap. I spent 35 of those pounds on my 130 mil travel air spring for cross country mode. I spent five of those pounds and admittedly called in a big favor with Finn at full factory suspension to make that spacer, that 7.5 mil spacer for the rear shock. But what have I got left? So I've got 60 quid, what can I do? Well, I chose to spend about 60 pounds on an angled headset. Now these forks here, the maximum travel they can go to is 140 mil, which is what they're already at. So it kind of was my best bang for buck without buying a whole new fork. So these headsets can take off a different number of degrees. This one here is a minus one degree headset, but you can get them in minus 1.5, minus two, and even theoretically, I suppose, you could run them the other way around to steepen up your head angle, should that be what you wanted. But I think bang for buck, 60 quid, to be able to, if you so wanted, drastically change your head angle, that, that's a pretty good deal. Also, something I'm really keen on, is because it's not raising the front end, it doesn't affect the seat tube angle. So it should, theoretically, still have that really, really planted seated position that you get with the trail mode. You've also got to consider things like handlebar flop, trail, front center, the list goes on. Angled headsets are indeed very useful for people with specific needs, such as downhill racers who want to go absolutely warp speed. They can also certainly be of use to people that want to Marty McFly their geometry into the modern age, but I would suggest doing your homework. Now, something that's quite interesting here is the offset difference between the two flip chip modes is about six millimeters. So that should be more than enough to cover for the five mil of adjustment I made in the stroke length. And by having it in the trail mode, I hope to avoid any clearance issues. Now, theoretically, in the initial part of the stroke, it might be more like the trail mode, and as it goes deeper into the stroke, it should become more like the rail mode, or at least that's the theory. Now, a small but important caveat here. You know, Nukeproof didn't just close their eyes and pin the tail on the donkey without too much thought. I imagine each one of these pivots was absolutely agonized over in terms of placement. What I'm trying to say is, you know, 
quality of travel and feel of the bike is far more important than an arbitrarily bigger number that might not actually give you the desired suspension feel that you require. People often write into us to ask about increasing travel by adjusting the stroke length. Now, this is something that if you were to do it, you need large amounts of clearance behind the seat tube because your bike is gonna flex quite a lot under high amounts of load. So just be careful with that. If you did want to start experimenting with your own bike and how to make it slacker, a good place to start can be some offset bushes and an angle spacer which sits just below the head tube and can take about half a degree off the head tube angle. So the final question, you know, is it worth it? Well, I think the XC mode is really worth exploring, especially with the shorter travel fork. That's because, you know, you can pump up your shock harder and largely kind of cheat the system there. But one thing you can't do is steepen the head tube angle by pumping up your fork. So that is really worth visiting. You know, if I was going to the Alps or something like that, would I fit an angle set? Um, you know what? I'd probably put the money towards some big old tires or some rims I didn't care about. As fantastic as they are and how effective as they are, a bike like this doesn't need it. But like I said, maybe your bike doesn't have such aggressive geometry and you want to get the numbers to be more kind of modernized or out there. Now, I have to say, you know, a bit of an egg on face moment because all of this changing and all of this fettling, you know, Nuke Proof were ahead of me from the off because the biggest difference I could make was changing that, changing the fork, the fork air spring, which is something they kind of offer with the ST. But it was a good time anyway. And that's that. Now guys, if you like the channel, don't forget to like and subscribe. Get in the comments below. Let me know what you think. Was I radical enough? Should I have pushed it harder? Because we didn't even get into anything like weight or anything like that. So um, yeah, lots of options. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time. Cheers guys.